Hi, Luke. Hi, Courtney. How are you? Good. How are you? Great. Good to see you. You are the bad boy of children's television. I, I, I'll, I'll take it, but uh, yeah. You uh, are Oscar winning, Emmy winning, and multi nominated. That's correct. That's accurate. Yeah. You won the Oscar for a film you directed, wrote, and starred in. Yep. Called God of Love. That's right. It was my uh, thesis film at NYU's uh, graduate film program. The strange first move of my career that then everything like, kind of followed after that. And you went on to be the showrunner on many shows, including Gordimer Gibbons' Life on Normal Street. That's correct. Yeah, that was on Amazon. And also the showrunner on Ghost Rider, the reboot. Yes, co-showrunner with uh, Andrew Orenstein. Yes. Yeah, that's been the most recent project is Ghost Rider, which uh, is how I know uh, Courtney, because you were... Uh, Star editor on that one. <laughs> Full disclosure, we work together. Yeah, three stars. Everyone's a star. I'm not saying you were the best editor. Uh, I I in case your uh, compatriots are watching, it was a it was a tie. I just want that to be clear. Team effort. Exactly. Yeah. You've also directed a ton of things, including the Matt LeBlanc starring film Love Sick. Yes. Multiple episodes on The Babysitters Club. That was wonderful. Marin, Mark Marin's show. Mm -hmm. Gordon Moore Gibbons and Ghost Rider as well as a bunch of other shows. Yeah, here and there, yeah, for sure. You've also done a lot of writing, including the film A Birder's Guide to Everything. Yes, co-writer on that. And mm -hmm. here we are, narrated by Meryl Streep. That's correct. Yeah, that was an animated Earth Day special for uh, Apple, uh, based on the Oliver Jeffers book. That, uh, yeah, Meryl Streep uh, was the narrator, which was, that's a crazy thing to have happen in your life, really, to like have Meryl Streep, you know, act out some of the lines that you wrote. You don't really have many notes. It's like, yeah, Meryl did it. Uh, she did a great. Uh, I, I have no notes. You've worked with a lot of editors over the course of your career. Can you sort of describe your ideal relationship with an editor? You know, when you're on set, you have to make so many decisions. It's probably the most stressful job on set, I would say, directing, unless it's like a really hard scene for an actor, maybe. But like, in terms of like how much you have to keep in your head and how much like... Um, of the clock you have to be, and you always are under the gun, like time-wise. And it's not like you have time to watch all of the takes or anything. So there's, even though when you're pretty confident that you got what you needed, there's still something you might've missed. There's still an element of, I guess, mystery and confusion and anxiety about how the whole thing will turn out. So then, which of course you're you know self-conscious about, and you're worried about. Uh, so then once you, get into the editing room, this is your first like audience really is this editor. And the editor's not there to like make the director feel good or like hold their hand, but like it helps. <laughs> it like makes the director feel better and more like taken care of. I guess I just always appreciate when the editor singles out something that worked really well. Even if a lot of the episode didn't work out as well as you wanted, <laughs> like start with some kind of like positive thing that like, oh, you know, the, the other people didn't quite do it this way. I liked how you did X. It just makes it a more comfortable kind of relationship that, you know, th these things end up being like therapy sessions for the director, or that's how I do it <laughs> anyway. I find there's no real um, advantage to like keeping your guard up around the editor. Like you might as well just be completely honest about what you were worried about or like what you think would work or like different ideas. Like the, I feel like the editor is the first person who's just like, who should be kind of completely on your side in terms of like, okay, how are we gonna figure this out together? But, which is to say, it's a little different. Like I've been the, the producing director on shows, so like I'm the EP, uh, and then I've been the guest episodic director. So if you're the producing director, then there won't be any conflict between what the show wants and what the editor wants because I am the show, like a showrunner ostensibly. But if you're the guest director, then there, I can see sometimes there might be the editor might be like, oh, what we're doing here is they're going to take this apart. Like, this isn't like the style of the show, but you still kind of have to like appease the <laughs> director for the director's cut. But I would say just do it anyway, <laughs> unless the director is obviously walking off a cliff into something that's going to just make the showrunner mad. Like, because that's what an episodic director doesn't want to do. Yeah. Is not get asked back. So, like, the editor is in a position to like save a director from like making that kind of mistake uh, where it's like, oh, look at this really cool intro to some scene that's elaborately edited that will probably just cut for, get cut from the whole thing like you the editor might know that and like it impresses the director to see it but the showrunner and the editor will not care as much because it's not like what's needed 
So the editor is in a position to both make the show, the episode great, and then also build up the spirits a little bit of the of the director in a way that will also help. There's just a more appetite for exploring things, trying things out, not feeling too bad if something doesn't work out and like figuring out a new way to do it. It's so different from being on set where you're dealing with dozens of people and making these quick decisions to like, now it's just you and one other person and that's the whole team suddenly and the, the assistant editor and like the post supervisor. Right. It goes from like a war movie to like a buddy comedy <laughs> where now it's these two people stuck in a room. Are they gonna figure out how to cut this episode of Babysitter's Club? And I would say a lot of directors to some extent Maybe they're just impatient in the editing room, but I always find it just to be a little bit of a relief because it's like, if we don't get something done before lunch, the world is not going to end. It's not like thousands of dollars go out the window. So like, I always find it like this weird kind of decompression chamber to get back into life from like set because it's, it's just so intense. And then, yeah, you, you, you kind of need this moment of reflection to see like, oh, did we get what we wanted? No matter how experienced I get anyway, like I still keep learning things from the footage. At the end of every show, I'm always like, and now I know what I'm doing. And I think that just must be a common thing. Like you just keep not quite mastering it because it's impossible, but like you, you can keep learning stuff. That's actually a very nice thing to happen in an edit suite that you continually get that chance to learn. For sure. I also think it's very interesting what you said about if it's a guest director and the editor needs to sort of hold their hand to bring the show to the style yeah, yeah. of the rest of the series. If you find that it, if it's going off a cliff, do you really, do you want to be told that, oh, you know, the showrunner doesn't like that kind of thing, doesn't like jumping the axis, for example? I think it would be more like an egregious example where it's just like, I think this is great, <laughs> but I think the showrunner might is probably just going to cut this part. So if it's important for you to show the showrunner this and you think that'll be impressive to that person, go for it. But I mean, basically tell them to not do it without telling them to not do it is, is sort of how I would handle it. I think it's more like, well, it's like the editor cannot say anything. Then this thing gets cut out later. You hear anecdotally somehow that the showrunner hated this part. And then you would be like, why didn't the, the editor, because then you feel betrayed a little bit. Like, why didn't they just tell me? I would have cut it out. Right. Uh, or the editor tells you, and then you have the choice. Then you could say, well, I, I, maybe the showrunner will be good. It's maybe this is cool enough to like justify it. Let's give it a shot. What's the worst could happen? And then at least that gives the director an opportunity to send a quick email to be like, Courtney did tell me like this probably isn't quite your style, but I thought it was kind of cool. She has it in the editor's cut. So see if you like it kind of thing. Uh -huh. You just don't want to feel like someone put you in a position to like not get asked back <laughs> where it's like, well, I wouldn't have done that thing if I knew it was going to cost me so much. Right. And it's rarely like a cut thing. That's not going to get you <laughs> asked back. Like there's usually com it's more complicated reasons of like why that, that would happen. But like, it's like any obvious mistake you end up regretting. Cause you're like, Oh, that's why I wasn't asked back to the show. <laughs> so like, you just want to reduce those. Right. Well, I always think of it as the editor's job to sort of, help get that director rehired unless they did it like a totally crazy bad job <laughs> totally no and, and that's an everybody wins situation then the, the editor looks good and and the director looks good totally the one kind of weird exception of that is sometimes directors will have really good episodes but will have been so slow on production and have like taxed the production in really stressful ways well their get out of jail free thing is if the episode turns out really well and then with the editor's help then it's like oh Get ready, crew. You're going to have to deal with this slow poke again next season because the, their, their episodes turned out great and it's hard to argue with that. Well, that's something that we wouldn't, as editors, would never know happened. Right. I always find it's, it's a weird kind of frustrating luxury the, look, the editors have where you start talking about like what went wrong on set and they're always kind of like, doesn't really affect me here. <laughs> All I have is the footage. It's sort of the um, preview of how the audience feels. Like the editor doesn't care how hard it was and the audience certainly doesn't care how hard it was or like when someone like that you broke for lunch and then the light changed, you know, these things like are what the director is carrying straight into the editing room. Like these specific memories of things that happened on set that went really well, it seemed exciting or that went really badly. That's probably what you're kind of thinking of. There's probably a few things you're really excited about and a few things you're really worried about. And it's usually related to, it's not like it was the best scene in the episode and that's what's going to be good. It's more like something that, that happened on set, but then that all becomes moot. Like once you, go through the into the editing suite like these are all interesting amusing stories but are kind of irrelevant ones all of a sudden so like the editor kind of has to like 
get them accustomed to this new thing. Like you had all these hopes, you had all these dreams. This is what you have. And then let's work with what you have, not with what you wished you, you got. <laughs> or with that shot that took four hours to get. Right. Usually it's like the shot that took four hours might be like a risky thing. Sometimes what's the most dispiriting, sometimes it just failed. And then you're just like, well, I tried. The worst is sometimes when it's just like, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> it was just like all that work for like a really extensive, like steady cam shot that was really, you know, complicated. And uh, yeah, told the story fine. You wouldn't really notice it or remark on it and probably didn't add that much. There were simpler ways to do it. <laughs> sometimes I just sort of like actually failing because it's like, hey, I told everyone what I was going to do. I knew there were risks involved. We all knew it. It just didn't work out this time. Because, you know, you want to be taking risks at, at, at some level, even though you know that, like, it's flying without a net a little bit. Like, you usually don't have the resources to reshoot. Because um, there's a lot there, there, there's a lot of simple, inelegant ways to do things. <laughs> and that's what no director, like, really wants to do. But the way the shoot is designed, how much time you have, like, sometimes you're kind of cornered into a lame way of doing it. Um, for, for reasons out of your control. So then when you do have like the space to do something kind of cool, you're like, well, I'm going to go for it. And then, and that's, that's probably the anxiety you're bringing into the, the, the room. Yeah. Like I said, it's like, did that really cool thing I come up with work <laughs> or did that thing that I was really worried about? Is that as bad as I thought it was? <laughs> and often the bad as you thought it was is really where the editor comes in. And sometimes you find out right away, they're like, oh no, there's, you had it on this other take. And I found it, like there was an actual like simple fix and it like wasn't even a problem at all, even though you were like, <laughs> like losing sleep over this like sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a weird thing where the editor has, they have more answers than you do at that point. Or like they, they kind of saw it all a, a little more. Like they might not understand the exact way you wanted, you a thing you had in your head, but like, they have saw things that maybe you didn't see before or had an idea that you didn't see. I find that your footage is, is sort of shot in a way that it, it, it's very clear what you have intended. I sort of, I say it's like you follow the footage. When you're watching the footage, you can see, oh, this is clearly the opening shot and this is clearly for that little moment. This is, right, the, right. This is the end shot for sure. Right. And I remember you mentioned that Coverage is death. <laughs> coverage is fear. Yeah, the coverage yeah. is fear. I like coverage is death. <laughs> coverage is death too. Creativity often goes out the window a little bit in terms of like how you're doing the whole thing. If, like if we were filming this scene and it was just like, we'll get a master over here. We'll get Courtney on the screen this way. We'll get me here. Like I literally just came up with that at the top of my head. Like that's not rocket science. Like, <laughs> so it's like, and sometimes it's just like, yeah, that, that was it. There's no other way to do it when that like, if you have the time and prep or the ambition, like it's it's cooler to think of cooler ways to to pull it off, you know. There's like a training wheels thing with coverage a little bit. Cause there are sort of these conventions in place that aren't rocket science of like just how to how to do this stuff of like figuring out where the axis is, you're gonna get a master, probably a medium, and then a close-up. And it, it could cut together fine. And I and I find like sometimes longer dialogue things, like with just two people, like sometimes that that's what proves how the conventions work, because you just are completely becoming kind of invisible and it's just the acting and the writing that are coming across and like you don't even think that there was a director doing any of this um but then once people start moving around or if it's like a cuttier kind of actiony thing like there's there's it's just not as straightforward per se and then and then sometimes it just will look sort of stupid like if you didn't think of something kind of more creative whereas yeah like a, a heart to heart of two people at a dinner table like don't reinvent the wheel like I, or that that's that's my feeling or like there you don't get much out of like all right, we'll start in the tea and then we'll come up and we'll go look into the teacup and then come back and then like, you know, and then there'll be a mirror or a re reflection in the tea or off the teapot. Your footage, you tend to lean into like oneers and like there's only one way to get somebody from across the room to the other person. Like you really lock into, uh, sometimes there's only really one choice and you go yeah. with it. You drive right. off the cliff with that one choice. Oh yeah, well yeah, well, Courtney, we, we always have the Thelma and Louise moment of the, uh, <laughs> of the cut, where it's just like, stay in the cut the whole time. Don't let your foot off the gas, Courtney. Thelma and Louise, drive it off the cliff. It's, it's, it's a little silly sometimes, but like, I, I feel like you do have to like commit to it. Cause if you do mess up, it does kind of like hurt the show. And like, there were simpler ways to do it that, that 
like wouldn't have been so bad, but would have just been lame. I'd rather have something great than something catastrophic and then something lame. <laughs> I would rather have the whole thing just totally explode and then like kind of feel good about what I tried to do. That's that's a dangerous way to to, to do it <laughs> a little bit. And you know, as your craft improves and you get to do it more, then like your odds of actually pulling these things off are, kind of increase. And I guess the, the, then the reasons why it's always seems like such a crapshoot is since like the sort of higher end kids shows is what I do. And there's just so many different elements that make that harder. Like you have so much less time because the kids are only available for a certain amount of time. The budgets usually aren't what it would be on like a non kids show, even if it's a good one. So like the, the bullseye just keeps getting smaller. And I'm like, well, if it's going to be good, let's just try to do it in this cool one -er. cause it's just a slippery slope. If you don't do it, then it's just going to be, then like a computer could have directed it. I'm sure the technology isn't far away where you can, they'll just be able to read a script and then just like <clears throat> enter it in the script, the characters, blueprints of the the sets yeah you basically want to do something the robots wouldn't be able to do right <laughs> otherwise you and i are out of a job right <laughs> the other thing that i noticed that you do that i think is amazing um is that not only do we get uh, line scripts from our script supervisor but we get another document that are editing notes that are directly from you not on all scenes but on some scenes yeah what made you decide well, to do that it's more the kind of thing that in retrospect I should have been doing right from the beginning. What I try to do is I'm trying to give people as few options as possible. Like I, I it's it's like I, I commit to the thing that I think will work that I've thought over a lot. So you'll have all these different shots, but there's really only kind of one way to get from point A to point, you know, N or whatever throughout the scene that I sort of have in my head. And it, it tends to be more the first four shots or five shots of the scene a key moment probably later and maybe the end that like wouldn't be so obvious to the editor per se. So I just run right over to the script supervisor and there's always like a little bit of a, uh, like on ghostwriter on with Diana, I just go right over to her and then like, okay, so we'll start in the Y until it pushes in on this line. Then we're going to turn around uh, and use the close up. This has happened rarely, but it does happen where like the thing that you obviously intended will not be in the editor's cut when you see it. And then the editor was like, oh yeah, I saw you wanted this wide, but this problem happened. And it's just like, there's no one who doesn't want to see see it anyway, <laughs> just to make sure. That, that happened on another show once, um, where like I obviously had this beginning of the scene figured out and the editor was like, oh yeah, it doesn't work for blah, 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 blah reasons. But it annoyed me that like she didn't at least show me why it didn't work or like having like, an alt thing where it's like, I tried, this is what happened when I tried it. So then at one point I was like, can we just go back to do it the way I wanted to do it? Can I just see what that looks like? And then it was fine. Or the thing she was worried about was like so easy to cut around and it was just like, um, yeah. So I, I still hold that against her. I was like, oh yeah, the person who didn't believe in me. <laughs> I'll remember that for the rest of my life. So what you're saying is that you would really like the editor to follow your, your editing notes and the line script first. And if for yeah, some yeah. reason they think it doesn't work, do another version. Uh, yeah. But as a separate thing, maybe at the end of the timeline or something, but definitely put the version that you intend in that first cut. In terms of what I, what would seem great to me would be like, show me the thing that I tried to do, mm -hmm. gauge my reaction, then just say, just so you know, I, this part I was worried about, I did do like a different version if you'd like to see it. I would have a lot of respect for that approach. Has there ever been another time where an editor sort of surprised you with a, a funny thing that you don't want people to do. This is probably the most subjective thing at all. It just works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't, which is like how you temp things with music. Cause it's, it can always be like a little subjective. And I think it's more sometimes like the temp will be so way off that like, you're like, oh, this person didn't get it at all. If they thought it was supposed to be this bouncy, funny thing when it was like kind of a, it was like a little melt. It was like, there was humor in it, but it was like the whole thing wasn't supposed to be funny. It was, it was like a, a more melancholy or introspective scene or something. I kind of find like when something is really nicely tempt when I first see it, I'm like this, I'm in good hands here. <laughs> or that's, that's it's, a, it's a promising sign. Music is probably the hardest thing in the whole process in a way to articulate. It just becomes these like adjectives about emotions. It's like, well, you know, I want it bittersweet, but like definitely a little more on the happier side or like, like, like things that are like very specific and abstract. 
or it, it gets into that indescribable quality of the the process that it's really just sort of feeling it out, especially if it's like a slightly complicated emotion. I think if it's just like, you know, the team gets the game winning point and like triumphant music, like that sometimes that's straightforward, but it's often these like talking scenes in the middle of the episode that can be a little expositional. There's not like a strong feeling behind it. The editor is really key in, in the temping because when, when they do the temp, that's what the composer takes the cues off of to like compose the real thing. But yeah, like I said, when you, you sit down and the, the editor has a lot of great instincts and you end up editing it less or sometimes, sometimes it's a weird thing where it's like the right cue under there, oh, the scene totally worked. Whereas if like it had been dry or like a wrong cue, you, you might find yourself like editing it more when it was just the wrong music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear like there's different schools about like, I just like to edit it dry first, but I find it if something like obviously is going to have music, then it, it's sort of not finished until you've put in <laughs> like, a, like you, it, it just will play so much differently. I mean, if it's the kind of show that doesn't have much music, then th that's what it is. But if it's the kind of show that does have music, then you sort of have to get it in there so we can start sketching it out for everyone of like what it's going to feel like when it's done. For sure. I find it always funny when like you start working on a show and they're like, oh no, this, this show is not wall-to-wall -wall music. And, right, right. And inevitably, all the shows are wall-to-wall -wall music. Yeah, yeah. Or you see it a lot of like HBO kind of stuff where it's more kind of atmospheric noises that are kind of musical. The drones. You're right. There are so few things that actually don't have a lot of music in them. I know that with our show, we had extensive conversations on season one before we even had any composed songs. Is that typically what you do with the editor before they even start? Do you say, oh, here are a couple soundtracks for films that I really like this sort of atmosphere? Like these ones would be great for like high school scenes. And uh, yeah, no, no, that's exactly right. Where, you know, you'll know about your show that there's certain kinds of scenes that are going to keep happening. So then it's good to just be like, oh, well, Perks of Being a Wallflower really nails this kind of <laughs> like uh, moody, innocent, melancholy feeling or whatever. Things never to temp. Oh. The Mission Impossible theme song. <laughs> good, good tip. No one will be impressed. No one will think it's creative. Do you find the same with like the Jaws theme or the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like anything that is instantly recognizable in the first bar. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, a, a good, bad, and the ugly showdown thing. It's almost like coverage. It's like, oh yeah, and then you put that, put in the ironic good, the bad, and the ugly thing or yeah, Jaws thing. Obviously everything I'm saying is under the, lens, under the umbrella of like a lot of my career has been in like kids television, which over the last 10 years, the form has grown a lot and things are a little more are much more cinematic than they, they used to be or like how they were shot for a long time. So I think there was a little bit of like, how do we make this like a movie? I try not to have like the fact that it's a kid show be an excuse not to be creative. Or like, if Mayor of Easttown is coming up with cool stuff, so should we. Even though the audience is for kids, still, right. sh still shoot it like, it's for adults or it's for a sophisticated audience. And, yeah. and also the same cut it like it's for a sophisticated audience. Totally. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, there's certainly like kind of an art house sensibility that's maybe a little more lyrical or cryptic that like is just not appropriate sometimes. Or, like it's just sort of not gonna work. But like there's no reason kids shows shouldn't be approached that way, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you like your notes annotated. Ah, yes. The way our notes always came across were a few pages of, you know, the time code and the note. Like, this is, the camera is shaky here, or this moment seemed a little fake here, or, or whatever. Um, so there's different schools of thought about, like, how to deal with this whole process. Because you get these notes, you address them, and then you send back the cut. There's certainly the school of thought of, like, don't send them back anything. Just address the notes, and then if they have any complaints the next time, they'll bring that up. Um, I find that it, it's possible it would, could work that way, but in general, if you gave notes on something, you're probably looking right at that specific part to see if the note was addressed. So you want some guidance about how, how that happened or why it happened or why it didn't happen. And I find if like, if, if they're asking for something you don't have, you just tell them we didn't, we didn't have this and, or this isn't what was intended or the, how you're seeing it is a little different than how we approached it. I, and I, I, I'm a big believer in like letting them know like what you are trying to do 
because sometimes the thing they'll be asking for is like, that doesn't, we didn't do it that way. Like she wasn't playing it angry. She was playing it amused. And that's, that's what we have. So we just have these Google docs or whatever, where the, the editors will get the notes first. They'll take a pass and then we'll kind of, yeah, they'll sort of line by line explain how something that something was addressed or why we couldn't do it. Then I'll sit down with the editor and go through those notes. I'll sort of rewrite the editor's kind of things there to give a little more context where needed. It helps get everyone focused on like what's possible. And sometimes it comes down to the word, like how it's worded. And some people give notes that are just as critical or maybe even a little wrong headed, but they're like framed so thoughtfully that you're happy to try it out. It's more like when it's a note that you don't agree with that also suggests that they missed the whole point of something that just starts to like great. You know, you got to look at it from their side too. Like they're giving tons of notes all the time on all these different projects that they have to keep straight. And like one got away from them that they didn't, they got a little mixed up and like, that's just what happened. Like, whereas I think when you're receiving the note, you're like, you take it so personally, like how did they not understand this one important, the whole scene is built on this or like, that's what I was trying to do. But like, maybe they had to go help their kid with Zoom school at that moment, got a little distracted and that's just sort of what it is, so. Also, specifically, you told uh, the editors on Ghostwriter at the beginning, season one, that you want us to annotate them back to you in a very specific way. For, for instance, I used to annotate before, before Luke, B-L. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say the note was, I can't hear what they're saying. Right, right. So I would do a hyphen, marked it for ADR, and then I would highlight that as red. Uh -huh. You said what you prefer, the three arrows, and then addressed, marked it on screen for ADR. Highlighted in calming blue. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think it's a really great thing. I've, I've done it ever, ever since on any other show. If you're not quite thinking it through and you just decided to like, I'm just gonna write all caps back in my notes or whatever, or red, cause it's easier to see or something. It adds this other layer of like tension. Yeah. That was avoidable. The whole process of editing at that point is basically criticism and how you receive criticism and how you grow from it. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it until just now, but since that's what it is, no matter who you are, you know, we all know the right thing is to do is like, if someone criticizes you and they're right, like, thank you for the criticism and uh, I will learn from that. And it's just like, and some people are, can actually like operate that way. But like, I find that like criticism can make you a little defensive, no matter who you are. And if someone criticizes you and you think that, per and you, and you know that person is wrong, then you have to like counter criticize them. Right. <laughs> And since it's all, that's all it is, is like feedback, is, is basically telling you to do something differently or asking if you can do something differently, then you, you kind of have to approach like the, the little pain that any, each of those things cause. They, they, there are things you can do to like lessen it all together and still do the same thing. So like, it might seem like a little bit of a <laughs> annoying extra step to like go through the notes and just make them all blue but just curtly writing something back in all caps, even if there's no like malice or anything intended by it, you're just like kind of dashing it off or something, it can wear a little bit because you're gonna have to go back and forth like a few times, like on all the episodes. So yeah, I, I just always try to like give as much context as I can. And, and the thing I've learned more of is like, give the context uh, uh, concisely. <laughs> I used to write like, and point 10 on this one note of why this doesn't work. I didn't really need to tell them this much uh, stuff. It's like, what, what's the information they need to understand this that seems like a logical, rational thing, and then convey that clearly. Because you want them to be like, oh, good point, totally understand. Or it's, or it's like, we see exactly what you're saying, but we would still like this. Because even, because then you, at least you were able to say what you wanted about why you thought, uh, you know, and these things can sound very silly in isolation where it's like, oh no, the whole, like they had to be in the center of the frame or in front of this window at this imp important part of the scene. And these are the reasons I thought through. So like, it's good to actually write that down. And then when you hear the other person say, look, I, I totally understand what you were going for, but we just really feel strongly that this other thing would work. I remember like my high school English teacher said something about like, this is in Delaware, mentioned something, about, oh, it was like a creative writing grad school or something. And it was like, and how everyone was just like so cutthroat and they were just trying to like, uh, and they were eviscerating each other's stories all the time. 
And, and the idea was that it was like, let's do that now because the business itself is going to be just as, as brutal. So you might as well be prepared for this. And I guess I've found that not to quite be the case that like, I mean, people definitely say thoughtless mean things about what you're working on, but I find most people are kind of nice and they sort of want it to work. So like part of everything I'm advocating for, you could also be like, oh, just grow up and take criticism. What's the, what's the big deal? But I think it's more important just take a little extra time to create the good relationship because there's other positive things that are going to come out of that as opposed to like being brutally honest, like be honest, <laughs> like there's no problem. I don't, I, it's the brutality part that I don't think it gets you that much. I like where this is going. I think it actually ties back to what you said before and that I think it's like that kiss kick method of criticism where you said when you come into the edit suite, you want the editor to initially tell you what they like, yeah, yeah. right? And it's the same idea with notes and changing the color to blue, not like doing I, I all caps, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and maybe explaining a little bit more why you think this, or you tried that and it didn't work, and maybe what about this? Having it more of a positive mm -hmm. uh, conversation and relationship. Right, I mean, I think the thing I prize more in like any department and any more like thoughtfulness is like always goes a long way for me. Because it really, it's like the audience is not thoughtful. <laughs> like, like once you put it out, once you put it out in the world, no one will think about what you were trying to do. <laughs> but, but until then, we're all on the same team of getting this thing perfect before it goes out in the world. So, like, we can be thoughtful about what we were trying to do and what we wanted out of it, and like how we can get there. Because, like, once once it's out there, the way people just judge a random thing that's on TV, you're just not charitable about it or like trying to understand the choices that were made. You're, you're just consuming it. Yeah, I guess the, the thoughtfulness is is um, is helpful for as long as we can milk it because it's not a part of the process forever, you know? That's so true. You've shared a lot of really interesting ideas and a lot of great tips. Yeah, probably career harming tips. Don't have any options in the editing room. Commit to things that will probably fail. <laughs> I've been honest with you about everything I've said. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luke. You got it. <laughs> All right.